Who's going first? Yeah. Can't get value. So Dan, with that enough, well, with the microphone on, it's still nope. it up. Didn't work. Hmm. So you might as well put this thing back in and control it all. And well, it's this. easier to do it from your computer then. Okay. That's the easiest way to do it. You just get to print PowerPoint on your computer, and when it's up for you, I'll just switch you over to that input. And then you have a... Do you want a clicker on yours? Raising prices. Yeah, okay, it's fine. I don't want to worry about it right now. Okay, well, I just want to let you know. Yeah, I don't want, I don't want to know about it now. I don't want to know about it. All right. So which bar, which one are you in? What's your thing and we're doing that? You gotta set these up with something I can understand and read. 427 agenda. Yeah. You got PC agenda one. There it is. Is that the one you want? Good morning. Welcome, everybody. This is a great crowd. We got a good topic today, and as you can see, it uh, drew in a nice crowd. That's the first time ever I'm going to have one of our speakers lead us in prayer today. <laughs> Pastor Vaughn. Thank you all for coming uh, and taking part in this. Yeah, please stand. Uh, just being part of this group. I just, over and over, what I tell people about pet water is the generosity of the people and the way that we care about community. So thank you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, you created this beautiful world and invited us to live here. 
created us to be here with you and with each other. Lord, so much of our conversation here as Pentwater Service Club is about different ways that we do that, in different places we do that, whether that's at the Artisan Center, whether that is in our civic spaces, um, whether that's in our educational spaces. Father, help us to do that with clear eyes, especially as Pastor Dan and I explore what is in our hearts about what it means, the challenges facing the Christian faith here in America now. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, we have two guests. And Dan Barnum Stegada is here, and he's from the uh, Congregational Churches of Christ in Shelby, in Hart. He's been at this for 35 years. Dan holds a Bachelor of Science from Valpo, Valparaiso University, and a Master's of Divinity from Bethany Theological Seminary in the Church of the Brethren. He has a passion for social justice, which includes feeding the hungry, providing housing, housing for the homeless, creating safe spaces for the disenfranchised, and affirming all people everywhere as unique and special creations of our loving God. He's been exploring the uh, concept of Christian nationalism as a movement that, in his opinion, is a perversion of the Christian faith and patriotism. Pastor Dan has served congregations, both United Church of Christ in the Church of the Brethren in St. Louis, Virginia Beach, Roanoke, Crown Point, Indiana, and currently in the Congregation of United Church in Christ in Shelby and Hart. So we are very pleased to have Dan here. Our second speaker we all know so well is our very own Pastor Vaughn and Reverend Dr. Vaughn Thurston Cox has served small congregations across Michigan, both Free Methodist and United Methodist Church from Rose Lake in mid-Michigan to the tip of the mid in Petoskey. He's a West Michi Michigander and he loves life on the lake. He's received his BA in English Literature from Grand Valley, his Master in Divinity, and his Doctorate in the uh, Divinity Doctorate of Ministry from Asbury Theological Seminary. With his church, he hopes to be the breath of God in community by loving God, serving others, and welcoming all. So let's hear it for our two pastors today. So I get to start. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a thing. <laughs> and so uh, I do have a, a few pictures and one nation under God, indivisible, uh, words uh, from our Pledge of Allegiance, uh, original words and added words to our uh, pledge to the flag. And I think it's uh, the image uh, is a good one uh, to at least... Uh, begin to describe what I think uh, Christian nationalism is. Uh, I, I will not be surprised if some uh, rise up uh, against me and uh, indeed perhaps even walk out. Sorry, Vaughn. <laughs> so what you get for letting the uh, heretic uh, go first. The UCC pastors. <laughs> yes, it's a, the the United Church of Christ is. Uh, we are used to uh, being walked out on, and so uh, I was uh, going to try to show just a short clip from uh, the 
uh, TV series Madam Secretary. It's, uh, but we can't seem to uh, get enough sound uh, for you all to hear it. I apologize about that. Uh, and so uh, Madam Secretary, played by Tay Leone, uh, is offering a speech following the signing of a peace accord. Uh, a peace accord with the countries located uh, in India, Pakistan, uh, and that kind of region that we already know is, is ripe for conflict. Madam Secretary is telling the gathered group uh, in the Oval Office, as well as those watching on television, uh, both, uh, uh, of course, her address is being televised, as well as the, the, the television show. And she's telling uh, everyone that she so appreciates those countries coming together because they are helping to eradicate the second most threatening thing that, that uh, impacts the entire world. And, uh, and then she says, if easing the threat of nuclear war is the second greatest uh, power, uh, the second greatest uh, enemy facing the world, then what is the first? And she describes the first as hate. Hate. Uh, and then goes on to talk about uh, how hate is being manifested and that is in the form of nationalism. Nationalism threatens the nation, this one and all of them. Christian nationalism then is a continuation of that. It not only threatens the country and countries, but it threatens the religious bodies around the world, and particularly in, in our country with our uh, uh, much appreciated freedom of religion. The freedom to believe as we <coughs> would want to believe. The freedom to not believe. Christian nationalism, all right, there we go. Uh, I, I was getting ahead of myself. I want to give you uh, two words. If, if I give you Christian and I give you American, those are your two words. And tell me, please, which is the noun and which is the adjective? Anybody? Depends on how you put it in a sentence. Uh, so. And well, I'll go so far as to say that the answer matters. Mm -hmm. both. They both can be. Depends on you both. Which would be, uh, given our presentation this morning on uh, the scourge called Christian nationalism, Christian, Christian. what then would be the noun and which would be. The Christian adjective. Noun. American's a noun. Amer American is the noun and Christian is the adjective in this case. No, no. I, I'm other sorry. Around. Other way around. Other, other way, way around. around. Yes, other way around. We are in this, uh, well, in this building, I will say, we're Christians who happen to be living in America. Christian is the noun in this case. American is simply the adjective. We could have put Christian Canadian, Christian English, Christian <clears throat> the Mexican, Christian, you name most of the sovereign countries of the world. 
Christian is the noun. And so with that notion, whether you accept it or not, we begin to approach a definition of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism, the belief that America is God's chosen nation. I, I don't know where Israel fits into that if we study our Old Testament and if we listen to Israeli rhetoric. But it is the belief that America is God's chosen nation. Now, it's not that far-fetched if you think about it. If we uh, kind of look beyond 1607 when English people landed in Jamestown, looking for uh, wealth. If we fast forward 13 years to 1620, and the pilgrims, most of them being separatists at the time, came and landed on Plymouth Rock. Have, 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 has anybody ever seen Plymouth Rock? Yeah, yeah. I, I saw it a number of years ago. I was expecting a big boulder. A little rock with a brass plaque on it, Plymouth Rock. But anyway, the people that came to Plymouth in 1620 were primarily Christian people looking for freedom from the Church of England. And so... Given that tradition, it's kind of easy to draw the conclusion that uh, America is a, a Christian nation and should be a Christian nation. Our forefathers are believed to have been Christians, although many weren't. The belief that America is God's chosen nation. So I, want, I need to keep going because we need to hear from Vaughn. And, and so, um, just as uh, you heard in the introduction of me, uh, which I wrote. So, of course, it could be a good one. <laughs> uh, I believe that America is God's chosen nation is a perversion. That's a strong word, isn't it? I, I copied it from Madam Secretary. <laughs> but I also agree with Madam Secretary. It is a perversion of both faith, whether that faith uh, be Christian, that is, uh, the faith that believes that Jesus Christ is God's uh, only beloved Son, that Jesus Christ is indeed the Savior of the world, or perhaps some of our interfaith religions that are free to worship in our country. Christian nationalism, faith nationalism, is a perversion of both faith and patriotism. Patriotism. Madam Secretary addressed that. Patriotism. Patriotism is that understanding that each and every individual has the freedom to believe however 
they desire to believe. Christian nationalists would call that a perversion of patriotism. I find it that nationalism is a perversion of patriotism. They are polar opposites. And, and, and so how, uh, moving quickly, how uh, does Christian na nationalism uh, manifest itself uh, today? Um, and, and so I just offer a, a few, uh, but I want to point out, as Christian nationalism gains power, and I, I insert there, and it is, I've experienced it here in our beloved Oceana County. I'll come back to that. But it, it's a, pro, a powerful predictor of intolerance. Not tolerance as, as our country is founded upon. A, a country where everyone is welcome. Everyone is seen as a, a valuable person in the great tapestry that is our country. And so, sure, these are probably uh, uh, not surprising to you. Immigrants, we are producing an intolerance to immigrants. Even when we think back to those days of the early 1600s and realize that our ancestors were immigrants. Racial minorities. We see that on our television screens. Perhaps we even see it from time to time, experience it. And of course, if, if uh, uh, it's similar to uh, the honest and, and very true supposition that I grew up with that you ain't much if you ain't Dutch. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> non Christians. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ and God the Father Almighty and their Holy Spirit, how can you call yourselves America? Christian nationalism gains power and control, and it is through opposition to gay rights. The LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters in our midst around the world. Gun control. Uh, this one might, uh, hopefully won't get me drawn on. And you understand I'm, I'm, I'm speaking provocatively on purpose. <laughs> Christian nationalism gains power and control, and it is. It supports... Harsher punishment for criminals, especially criminals who are not white. Excessive force against people of color. 
and traditionalist gender identities. Men make the money, women raise the children. Period. No take backs. I'm hurrying. So, within this construct of Christian nationalism, perhaps we need to visit the question, well then, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Is Jesus the conquering warrior who takes no prisoners and wages holy war? That would be a Christian nationalist Jesus. Maybe a Jesus whom some of us know and believe in, but others of us might find offensive. Well, not my Jesus. Perhaps some of you would, would uh, uh, find yourself aligning with the Jesus, a sacrificial lamb who offers himself up for the restoration of the world. For God so loved the world. The whole world. everyone in the world. And as powerful telescopes show us images, there's a possibility that our world is rather small. There's an entire universe out there. that maybe you can see on Star Trek, any of its iterations. I'm hurrying. I want to just touch on this because uh, I have experienced this in our Oceana County. I don't know that I'm going to uh, publicly say how I've experienced it, just very truly, I tell you, I have experienced it. It's the notion of steeple jacking. Christian nationalism advocates for Christian uh, uh, steeple jacking. You remember how airplanes are hijacked, cars are hijacked. Well, so too. Churches, whole congregations can be steeple jacked. It, it's a term that uh, flows out of a book of the same name, the same title. It, it's co authored uh, John Dorauer, uh, who is, uh, at least for another two months, the president and general executive minister of, uh, well, at least my, United Church of Christ. Steeple jacking. The intentional and orchestrated attacks on mainline Protestantism. Do you find your acronym in my list. The United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church of America, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, and, yes, the United Church of Christ finds itself 
with people from other churches visiting. That's a good thing, isn't it? All of our churches need visitors. As we hope and pray that those visitors will jump into our boats. It's the easiest kind of evangelism we can do. It takes practically no effort on our parts when visitors come and jump into our boat. Oh, hush. It's always the pastor. <laughs> and it's from a pastor. A UMC pastor, no less. These denominations, necessarily our uh, denominations, if I can be so bold, need to be developing ways to recognize and then combat. Well, that doesn't sound very Jesus-y to me. But to repel those notions of being taken over taken over by Christian nationalism, taking control of country and God the Father Almighty. I believe in inclusive language, but I put God the Father Almighty because it flows from our Apostles' Creed that many of us can possibly recite uh, on the spot. If we adhere to the idea that we are created in God's image, Christian nationalism would have that changed, that God is created in Christian nationalism image. God is created in the image of Christian nationalists. Do you find that offensive? I see some nodding heads and a few brave hands raised. talked about holy war and I believe we are in a holy war and the approach to this war cannot be more debate on theological and biblical principles a way this might be manifest is that with a mass shooting happening, if not daily, then weekly, we offer our thoughts and our prayers. And perhaps that's good. But is it good enough? Is it good enough? This from a Methodist uh, activist. Uh, any any of uh, our UMC folks here know of Andrew Weaver? They, that's the Christian nationalists, are playing a different game. We still think the game is touch football. They're down. But they are playing tackle with no pads. In some countries, that's called rugby. <laughs> and they are playing tackle with no Pads. And Mr. Weaver concludes you can't win 
the game if you have this mindset. Christian nationalism. Uh, if you are UMC, how, how many are UMC? Perhaps you recognize this image because it's yours. Do you recognize it? No. Okay. I found it on the internet. It's amazing what you can do if you Google something. There's all kinds of Methodists. Well, that's right. There are all kinds of Methodists, and they live in this county, don't they? <coughs> Christian nationalism. Yeah. It's real. And it's dangerous. At least, that's what I think and believe. All right. I had 15 minutes and I took... <laughs> Typical preacher. Typical minister who can say it and repeat it. Once a pastor gets started, once a preacher gets started, you don't have a big enough hook <laughs> to yank them off the pulpit. So you have the advantage. He doesn't know you. You're a guest. He knows me. And I just I just turn the lights off and the microphones off and everything you know turn the video off and when they were done so it's, it's and, no and I have a story for that I, it, was, <laughs> it was the church I served in in the Roanoke area and uh, Eddie was the man's name and he came uh, to the back you know where you where you shake the preacher's hand and you say uh, some kind of mumbled form of nice message preacher whether you mean it or not. Eddie comes and he says to me, ran a little long today, Pastor. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know I did, Eddie, but last week I, I finished ten minutes early. You weren't here last week, were you? I figured I had built up some credit. So Okay, now I'll try and be quiet. I want to thank you for inviting me to speak. It's been my joy to be a pastor here at Petwater. Um, my, I believe, personally believe that religion is central to the human experience. And I'm not just saying that because I wear a strange collar sometimes and I'm volunteered to be the guy who says prayer uh, at special events, though that is a hazard of my job. I believe that we are spiritual beings that have a material existence. I believe that religion is central uh, to how we experience the world. Uh, faith has consumed my life not only personally but professionally. Uh, the state of Christian faith in the United States matters to me and all religion. I'm speaking about the Christian faith because that's what I have experience in. I don't think I can stand here and speak to you about the Islamic experience or the Jewish experience because that is a mine. Completed my graduate and postgraduate work in fields of theology, was ordained in the Free Methodist Church before coming back to the United Methodist Church. And uh, for those of you that might have experience in the Free Methodist Church, uh, the Free Methodists are free as the United Methodists are united. <laughs> All right, so that's not working. Can you go ahead and slide? <laughs> um, here we have a little lesson in Latin. My people tell you I love little word lessons. Uh, here's this word, religare. Um, you can go ahead here. Religare is the Latin word that means to bind or tie together. I love that word, and I want to reclaim this word. It's not fundamentally an institutional word, okay? Though we have to have an institution because we're human beings and we have to figure out a way. How are we going to make this decision? How do we figure out who repairs the, the uh, fire alarm or the elevator? Well, we have to have a committee. 
least that's the Methodist answer. Always committing. Um, this is a mending word. Good religious practice. Oh, I have to start my alarm in 15 minutes. An alarm is going off. Uh, good religious practice, my, from my perspective, always heals and strengthens community. Now go, yep, there we go. There we have uh, the scriptural reference. And go forward one. Uh, I want to talk about my theological perspective. I am a theologian in the Wesleyan tradition. And so when I come to religious practice, I come with two key guides. That is love, holy love of God and holy love of neighbor. This sits at the heart of John Wesley's theology. He was not a systematic theologian. He was a pastoral theologian. And so when uh, you say, well, Methodists, we don't believe anything. Well, it's not entirely true. We have a frame. We have a sturdy frame. And oftentimes when we come to a question of interpretation in Scripture, what we're, what we're passing things through is this lens of holy love of God and neighbor. And that's going to shape what I look at today. Go ahead here. Uh, what is threatening... What are the challenges facing American religion in the now 21st century? Um, it isn't pluralism, secularism, diversity, the rise of the nuns. Does everyone know what nuns means? It's not the NUN. It's not the people in habits. It's the growing, exploding number of people who have no religious affiliation. The nuns, they're called. It's not multiculturalism. It's not Walt Disney. No, Mickey Mouse is not coming after your kids to make them atheist, gay, trans, socialist hoodlums. Uh, I know I've heard that since the 1980s. Cancel culture started in uh, conservative churches I attended as a kid that said, no going to Disney World. No buying Disney tapes. So, it's important to remember Christianity only became the majority faith in 313. The first 300 years of our faith practice, we were in the minority. It wasn't until Constantine that we become the majority empowered faith, and then it is only in the empire. Go ahead a slide. Now, still today, we are... The majority faith, and at least these are the top ten places. U.S., Mexico, Philippines, China, Germany, Brazil, Russia, Nigeria, DR, Congo, and Ethiopia. We are like huge, bounds, majority faith. And uh, in much of the world, including the Holy Land, they're the minority. Okay? Minority status didn't end us in the beginning of our faith. They didn't. And we are not the minority set faith right now in the world or in the United States. Go ahead and slide. This is important. What we're experiencing, okay, is social dislocation and a loss of cultural privilege, not religious persecution. Okay, and that's an important... I go back. I, who here remembers their first Gideon Bible, the New Testament? But you, get it. you probably got it at school. I remember when I was a little grade schooler. And they said, the Gideons are here. They're going to give each of you a little New Testament. I remember that. King James. Because that's what we all read. <laughs> and we did that at the school system. Um, my gosh. And, and, and all the stories about us in our... Uh, you mentioned Jamestown. I think growing up, most of us heard about Plymouth. We were a Christian nation coming up. Well, the fact is, is that we're not being asked to not practice our faith. What we're finding out is, suddenly I have a Muslim neighbor. I had a Buddhist, I had a Buddhist uh, foreign exchange student. A Buddhist foreign exchange student in our home for a year. We're not being asked to not practice our faith. We're being asked to, can we share space? A practical way that we see privilege uh, that I do as a parent of students is that I get my faith holidays off. 
I get my faith holidays off. My kids get them off. And that's a simple way we see that. Do Islamic students get that? Do Buddhist students? Sing so ahead slide. So I talk about the challenges that I perceive the Christian faith in our century facing. The first is um, evangelical fundamentalism and fundamentalism. They were a theological movement formed in a reaction against theological liberalism in the 19th and 20th centuries. And they came to the fore in the United States uh, during the Monkey Scopes trial. None of us were here for that um, lawsuit involving the teaching of evolution in, in school. The reason this is important is because fundamentalism holds a strong influence in the evangelical world, of which I was a part for many years. That makes up 25 to 45 to 40% 40 of the American population, depending on the source you look at. Those are a lot of people, okay? They emphasize a literal reading of scripture outside of history, language, culture, and science that prioritizes adherence to specific doctrines. So I love the Free Methodist Church. I'm forever indebted to them. But let me tell you a difference between that church and the church I serve in now. I was encouraged to explore scripture in the Free Methodist Church. But I was told the answers first. <laughs> Do all the reading you want. Just remember this is where you end up. It encourages, uh, emphasizes a reading of scripture that prioritizes adherence to specific doctrine. Go ahead and slide. So the reading becomes self-reinforcing, and because of that, the tradition <laughs> remains suspicious of education as a whole, okay? The fundamentalist movement is suspicious of education as a whole, because if you give people an education, and you give them a book to read, what happens when they read that differently? Um, I would go ahead, one. Try it again. There we go. Uh, one way that this manifests itself, and this is, little, this is going to seem a little idiosyncratic, it shows up in translations of scripture. Because if you are suspicious of education as a whole, and you distrust these liberals who are saying, go to the culture, go to the word studies, you are held captive to the interpretation of the translator. Okay? Translation is just an act of interpretation. This is Genesis 3.16. Um, the fall has just happened. And God is now meeting out judgment and saying, Snake, you're going to crawl on the ground. Man, man, you're going to work hard. Anyone that, I know we have a few people that cut wood. You know, thank Genesis chapter 3. You'll work by the sweat of your brow. Here we have this passage that talks to Eve. And I'm sorry, I didn't get the NRSV UE version. I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Uh, this is a recent, very conservative translation of Scripture. Um, this was one of the last revisions they made to the ESV before they said, it is now done, there will be no, this is as good as it gets. If you are in the literalist camp, and you want to understand the role of women, what does this tell you? you your desire, women, will be contrary to the husband. You want to do things differently, but he shall rule over you. Let's go to a second example. Go forward one. This one just gets my goat. Um, this is the book of Acts, and... So a little history of the Christian scriptures are written in Greek. Then a guy named Jerome translates them into Latin for everyone. And everyone reads Latin after that for hundreds of years. A lot of the Greek uh, scrolls just are lost or not used for centuries afterwards. And you have these two names, Andronicus and Junia. Junia is a feminine name, okay? That's a girl's name, a woman's name, actually. 
It is a woman's name. Jerome says, oh, they're talking about Apoc. This must be, the Greeks must have made a mistake. And he makes it a masculine name. So when you read the King James Version, you get Junius instead of Junia. English Standard Version gets to this verse, and they've already established that women are submissive, right? They can't get around the uh, whole problem of, well, all the Greek trend, all the early passages, all the ancient scrolls say a woman's name. So what they do is say, Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen of Pelagrimus, they are well known to the apostles. Instead of every other translation which goes, they are prominent among the apostles. This seems like a small thing. But when you form a movement that is fundamentally opposed to expanding knowledge, you can't, you, you end up with these, these problems. I'm going to go um, forward a slide. We begin to see this a little more clearly about what happens when you end up with in a movement that is fundamentally opposed to education. PRRI poll found in tw March 2021, only 45% of evangelicals were vaccinated. COVID's raging. What's the problem? We don't believe. We, we fundamentally don't believe in your science. Survey conducted in October 2020 by Dennis University found 50% of white evangelical Christians either agreed or agreed strongly with QAnon beliefs. Everyone familiar with QAnon? Crazy, wacko, like way out there. Um, Marshall Terry Green. This is, yeah, I thought a long time. What, what do I bring? What is threatening the church? It isn't the, all these demographic changes, because the church has survived demographic change. Look, you know, we had a few hundred years where we were predominantly white and European. Aberration. <laughs> Most of our history, we've been brown of some, some stripe or kind. Um, it's our fear of education. I remember as a student when I went to college, I don't think I was given a copy, but I remember all those talks about, checking my time here, I think I have three more minutes, all those books about staying Christian in college. Folks, if you go to a church that tells you, don't read this book, don't explore that, please think about where you're worshiping. We should never be afraid to learn more. We should never be afraid to learn more, because... God's big. And, yeah. All right, so I need to keep going. Uh, secondly, and this may be more important, I don't know. We've exchanged our spiritual identity for a political, or political one. Um, the interesting thing, when I first found this out, is you have 25% of Americans say they'd be unhappy if their child married someone of a different faith. 35% of Republicans and 45% of Democrats would be upset if their child married someone of the opposite party. We have exchanged our spiritual, we have so invested ourselves in our political identity, which I understand we are in a highly polarized environment, but folks, like, God is not a Democrat, and God is not a Republican. God existed before either of these parties. You know, when faith first started, they had no idea about democracy. <laughs> it was a monarchy, it was an empire. Um, we, live, we have to live in this tension. We are blessed as American Christians to be able to vote and participate in democracy. Praise God. I'm so happy that we are. But we are not, all, we are not of this world. The kingdom that Christ is ushering in is not of this world. I believe God will transform it and redeem it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we shouldn't participate. What I'm saying is we will not be saved 
by Donald Trump or Joe Biden or by what laws that we manage to get passed, that will not save us or the world. <laughs> and now I'm on my last point, so that's great. Woo! So what do we need? This is it. One slide. I think what we need is a Jesus-centered spirituality. This is one thing I love about this particular congregation. I think that we have a Jesus-centered spirituality. What I mean by that is... We need a spirituality that is less about Jesus or about our politics or about what we happen to believe about Jesus. We need a spirituality that rests in the life of Jesus, patterns itself to become his body here in the world. And I have yammered on now for 15 minutes. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Really had us put on our thinking caps today, so thank you for really stretching us, and uh, we appreciate your time with the service club. We have some guests today, and um, who would like to introduce our guests? Go ahead. I'll introduce Dave Kirsten. He's here, he lives in Pentwater in Chicago, 50-50, and he's here uh, as a guest, my brother-in-law. And if you ever see some big waves in the lake because this big old boat's been going by, might be his. <laughs> Chris Craft. We've got the old big Chris Craft down the bottom. Right. 40 foot Chris Craft. Maiden Hall. And Mike and Janet Wadley are new, are new members. Yeah. Speaking of which, guys. You know, we had a big argument when Mike and Janet showed up here, and it was a big fight between John and Beth. And Beth was representing the museum, and John was representing the treasurer's job here at the church. And they both won. <laughs> Janet came and is the assistant tre treasurer at the church, and so uh, Mike ends up with the historical society and is the treasurer at the historical society. So thank you for volunteering so much that you do, and welcome to the service club. So. The uh, time is waning. We're going to move to the next slide, please. We have lunch at Antler for those who want to join us. Um, we have a board meeting on Monday. We're painting the gazebo. We've, if you're on uh, Sign of Genius, we have five painters as of last night, I checked, uh, for Tuesday, and um, we have four signed up. So we need a couple more on uh, Wednesday, and we could use another one on Tuesday. And the long range forecast is Wednesday's great, and Tuesday is the rain will be ending in the morning, so we should be okay. But uh, that's our service project, and uh, Tuesday and Wednesday next week. Next week on Thursday, we'll be at the school, and Dr. K will give us a school report. Business meeting coming up. Oceana Economic Alliance is on the 18th. We're going to the school again on the 25th for a band concert with our new band director. I better go double check that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're good on that, I'm sure. And um, will be our last meeting is our annual meeting, which is the election of officers, and that will be at the school. And as a student of the month, both the uh, fourth and the first are student of the month, and our annual meeting. And then we on that same weekend, the fourth at seven o'clock to or six o'clock, five o'clock to seven o'clock. We'll be at the marina area, and it's the downtown party, sponsored by Service Club. And uh, we'll have Sign Up Genius out on that. You can volunteer to help with the Duncan Wagon. And our first festival is the 17th and 18th. We'll have the Duncan Wagon out for the Spring Festival down on the green. So are there other announcements here today for the group? 
He's getting dunked. I do announce that we <laughs> really appreciate the great attendance today. Mark? Oh, I just wanted to make the observation that the presentations weren't what I thought they would be, but I, I really appreciate the um, courage of both speakers today. It was very good. Very good. Other items for the good of the cause. Okay. We uh, are Mark, I'll just uh, yes. let, let everyone know that we had a successful highway cleanup on Tuesday morning. Uh, we had 13 people who showed up, and I think we picked up about 19 bags of uh, trash mm -hmm. along the expressway. Uh, we do the two miles from uh, Monroe down to Wayne Road, and uh, we do both sides of the expressway, about two miles on each side. And so thanks to everyone who participated, and hopefully we'll have even more next in July. Yeah. Do we, uh, Keith put I'll, send a, I'll send a picture to Ken so that we, he can put it in the... Uh, Oh. Makes constant contact. In the uh, constant, constant, constant contact. Yeah. Email next Tuesday. And Keith, thank you for your leadership on that. We got done and we had lunch and Keith says, well, I need to go back out. We got one more section we got to cover. So that's and I, I could have picked up three bags. I only picked up two because that's all I put in my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the second bag I was picking up and it was getting so get, get full that every time I'd set it down to go pick something up and it'd tip over and stuff would fall out. <laughs> I had to put it all back in. When I got back to the first bag that I already tied up and set alongside of one of the delineators, I tied up the second bag and opened up the first bag again so I could put a few more things in that. But it was yeah. well, a lot of stuff. Thank you, Keith. That's, that's the backbone of the service club is volunteerism. Chris, you had an announcement. Yeah, I did. Um, February 20, yeah, February 24th or 27th is the next election. It's the presidential primary. We're going to be in desperate need in our precinct for election inspectors. So if anyone has ever thought about wanting to come out and work on election day at the poll, um, contact Mo or Maureen um, Murphy at the township office. She's the, uh, the uh, township clerk. She runs the election for our precinct, and she's the contact that you need to get a hold of to, to register vote. With, the, with Prop 22-2 passing, we're going to have nine days of, of early voting. And having done that in Illinois, you need a lot of extra hands on deck. So. It's not just one day anymore with a bunch of absentee ballots, but it's nine days of open early voting. So if you've got it in your heart to do that service um, function, it's really not hard, but I recommend it. Can you describe what is an election inspector? Okay, so some people call them election judges. They, there, there are multiple positions um, where you could serve. One is to greet people when they come in, check their ID. Uh, if they don't have an ID, you have them sign an affidavit, and that's now law because that was part of Prop 22-2. Um, and then you turn them over to the next station. The next station um, uh, enters that person in as having voted or uh, given a ballot, and they get entered into the computer. And then ballots are issued at the next station and, and uh, based on corroboration that you're supposed to be voting in this precinct. And then um, you get your ballot, you vote, you drop it in the tabulator and you go home. So we have people at the tabulator to help, help anybody push the ballot through the tabulator if they get put in, uh, in wrong alignment. Um, there are people that are assigned to the ballots. There are people assigned, we, and we have to have Democrats and Republicans um, because it's it's almost like too deep leadership in scouting, right? You gotta, we, we need one of each party. And um, especially at the position of um, um, opening the uh, absentee ballots, and Gigi is one of our election inspectors as well. Um, so throw in anything you think I'm missing, but um, <laughs> is a training required? Yes, and and, and that's why you know if we could, uh, and 
they're going to need to set up training. I know the county is is extremely frustrated because the legislature hasn't even finished writing the laws to go with the prop that was just passed. And so, you know, they really almost ought to postpone it a year, whether they end up doing that or not. But I'm talking about the nine-day early voting. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But uh, we also discovered that it was too tight a space in the township office, so we may be moving to Park Place, but do we do nine days of early voting at Park Place? Probably not, because there won't be the same kind of volume for nine days. It'll probably be at the township office for the early nine days, and then Park Place for the day of election, if, we, if there are still that many people that haven't voted. And it, it's a crapshoot right now. So. Anyway, any other questions, let me know. Thank you, Chris. We, uh, Dan and, and Vaughn, uh, we do have a speaker's fee, and that's our famous <laughs> cover. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's made right here in the kitchen. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Anything else for the good of the cause? All right. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.